River Run International Film Festival. I'm Rob Davis, Festival Director, and it's a great pleasure to have all of you with us this evening for what promises to be a very special night at this year's River Run. I do want to thank our title and presenting sponsors of this year's festival, and they are the University of North Carolina School of the Arts, the City of Winston-Salem, the Arts Council of Winston-Salem and Forsyth County, and the Millennium Fund, and special thanks to tonight's sponsor, Terry Robertson and EXP Realty. So if we can have a round of applause for the sponsors. <laughs> now, we are so delighted tonight to have as our special guest, Christy Zia. Now, I want to just say a few words about Christy's career. What is so impressive about Christy is that her career is multifaceted in film and television. So, for example, she has been costume designer on films like Alan Parker's Fame, on Shoot the Moon. Uh, she has been a director. Uh, for instance, the current television series New Amsterdam. I know she has directed for that series. Uh, a documentary that she actually produced and directed, everybody knows, Elizabeth Murray, uh, had its world premiere at the Tribeca Film Festival not long ago. She's an accomplished producer. She uh, received an Academy Award nomination for As Good As It Gets when it was nominated as Best Picture. So Christy has worked across the film industry far and wide, but I haven't yet gotten to what she is especially accomplished at, and that is production design. And when you look at her credits just in production design, it is like a who's who of film titles. It's films like Goodfellas, The Departed, Philadelphia, Silence of the Lambs, many, many others. And what is so impressive about her production design career is that major directors in the field of modern cinema, and I'm talking about people like Martin Scorsese and Jonathan Demme, these directors want to work with her again and again and again. And so while the list of films that she has designed stands alone as an impressive body of work, the fact that so many prominent and significant directors choose to work with her again and again is a testament to her expertise. And of course, she did receive an Academy Award nomination for production design for Revolutionary Road. Now, the order of tonight's program will be, uh, we do have a few film clips that we would like to share that highlight her career. We also uh, will have an onstage conversation with Christy and Deborah Levine. Deborah is Dean of the School of Filmmaking at the University of North Carolina School of the Arts, and she herself is an accomplished filmmaker. So I'm looking forward to hearing what Deborah and Christy have to say. But before we bring them up, let's just take a look at a few clips which highlight some of the films Christy has been responsible for. And Dean Deborah Levine. Welcome, welcome, you got us. You are a goddess. Uh, I thank you, Rob. We're so pleased to be here, and I uh, want to just say what a gift I think River Run is to the city of Winston Salem, and it starts at the top. So thank you. It's my true honor to be sitting here, and um, while you've just seen the, I'm sure just the surface of this career that is so profound and so deep. We won't have enough time to really get into it completely, but I want to try and cover as many important points that I think this audience will be interested in. So I would love to start, if you don't mind, by asking you to help us understand the definition of what the work you do, what it is. Uh, production design basically takes care of everything that you see that's visual with the exception of costume being a very separate thing and makeup and hair being separate. But locations, sets, props, choices of items like paintings and locations and 
all the set dressing that you see in the film. That's 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 what a production designer does. Um, typically, I have a crew of about seven really highly qualified people who are the keys, uh, being props, construction, paint, um, art directors, graphic artists. Um, Special effects, I have a lot to say about. Visual effects, I have a lot to say about. Um, so it's a kind of overall umbrella for anything to do with the film of a visual, of a visual nature. I work with, you know, obviously I work very closely with the director. I also work very closely with the director of photography. Um, and of course the actors. And of course the producers, because they want to know how much it's all going to cost. <laughs> um, so it's a it's a multifaceted, a highly pressured, pressurized career. And then, as Rob was pointing to, you have had um, you've, you've taken roles across the spectrum of filmmaking, but you were sharing the story with me today, and if you wouldn't mind sharing it, I think when Rob was speaking to how many iconic artists want to work with you again and again and again. You gave me a story that I thought really explains your ability to really take a, 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 the long view of the story. It was a, it was a, how you were how you staged. Do you, oh, would you mind right. sharing? Yeah. So the film you're going to see tonight um, is the first time I ever worked with Jonathan Demi, um, and that was a a real coup for me because I always thought he was brilliant at what he did. Um, and I got a phone call one day from Kenny Ott, who was his producer at the time, who said that Jonathan was looking for a new pair of eyes, and that means a new production designer. And would I please come in and talk to him about this new project that he was going to do called Married to the Mob? So I read the script, and I decided to come in with a book that I thought was emblematic of what I thought the movie needed. Um, and that was an Amy Arbus photography book, that's Diane Arbus's daughter. And it was a whole series of portraits of people in their suburban homes. And they were quite extraordinary. So I brought that in and they said, we'll be right back. They all went to the bathroom, ha ha. And they came back and they said, we'd like you to do the film. So we started to work on the film. and. Um, it was pretty easy to do because it was basically the kind of thing that I was really going to enjoy doing. It was kind of extreme um, design work. And it all took place in New York, with the exception of a little piece at the end, which takes place in Miami. And at the end of the scene, which you actually saw a piece of uh, in this little uh, clip, of where Mercedes Rail comes in with a gun and she starts to shoot her husband or tries to shoot her husband. Um, so that location became a very big problem. We couldn't figure out where to shoot that. And I had found um, a penthouse apartment uh, on the water outside of Miami, north of Miami, uh, that had a 360 degree terrace that used to be, was going to be Hubert Humphrey's uh, Southern White House. Well, you know what happened there. <laughs> um, so, but it was a white box, basically. It didn't have any furniture in it. And I was very excited about this. And I kind of showed it to Jonathan. And he said, well, I don't get it. I don't know what it is. It's a box. It's a white box with a nice view. Um, so in desperation, because we really needed to make a decision on this, I decided to do a whiteboard model of the, of the place, which is a physical board model. They don't do them anymore. Most of these things are now in computer form. But this was a physical little board. So at lunchtime, I brought this whiteboard model of the place, and I basically explained to him how I thought it should be shot. <coughs> and it meant angles looking at her coming in the door, reverse angles on on the husband, and then she would start to shoot him, and when she missed him, something would fall off the wall, and he would leap over the bar, and she'd get something behind him, bang, everything, bang, 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 bang. And there was silence in the room when I was done, and then suddenly Kenny Ut, who's a very seasoned 
producer and Jonathan, also seasoned director, said, we've never seen anything like this before. And it basically was that I had sold this location based on how it was going to, how the scene was going to be blocked. And, you know, sometimes, you know, history now says to me that that was a very unusual thing. But for me, it made perfect sense because then I could tell him why I thought this was a great location. And history tells you this because? Because I've done it again and again and again. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but were, you, were, you, were you suggesting that maybe not everyone is this collaborative? Oh, well, or? yeah, Jonathan is an extraordinary, or was, unfortunately, he's no longer with us, but he opened up his heart and his mind to anybody who had a great idea. It could come from the elect chief, chief electrician, it could come from the prop man, it could come from the sound man, it could come from me. And he, he gave us the opportunity to grow with him on the project. And I learned that. And so every time I've directed or every time I've done anything, someone comes to me with a great idea uh, or any kind of an idea, I'm very, very willing to listen to it because that's what film is. It's a collaborative art form. Um, you mentioned white walls, you mentioned texture. I couldn't help but be awestruck when watching this compilation of your incredible range of, and understanding of texture and color. I mean, when you look at the clips, whether it was the checks on the, the bed clothes and then checks in the costume design that are all linked, or whether it's a stark white wall, but the frame within a frame within a frame, there's depth, there's texture. Or if it's what I still am haunted by, the, the silence of the lambs world, um, you know, the, the kinds of shapes and the kinds of specificity and details. How is it that you are able to create so many different worlds with such detail, with such specificity, because it, every world you create is different, unique, and yet they are, they are complete. I feel that if we could step in there and inhabit them, how do you do that? What's your process? <laughs> well, I have really good people working with me. Um, you know, a great set decorator will, will come with ideas. Um, but typically what I like to do is I do a lot of research um, and the research can be all over the place. It can be art, you know, fine art. It can be other movies. It can be um, uh, exhibitions. Uh, photography is a great source for me for detail. Um, but I remember a really wonderful production designer once telling me, Brian Morris, a British production designer, that he always gave it layers. It wasn't just the surface stuff. You know, you could open a drawer on his sets and there'd be stuff inside. And like on Revolutionary Road, for example, the kitchen, you know, she could open any drawer in that kitchen and there would be stuff inside. She could go to her dresser and there'd be makeup and, you know, bobby pins and nonsense in the, in the drawers because it would give the actors an opportunity to really get into their, their parts. And it would also give me a chance to get deep into the characters because that's the key. The key is that you have to satisfy the story. The difference between me and an interior decorator or an architect is that it's all based on what you need to tell in the story form. You know, what is, what is the visual form that's going to help us tell the story? So that's, that's kind of, and then I just like detail, detail, detail. Do you work with the actors to, to ask them how to populate the set or the space? Well, occasionally I do. However, <laughs> on Manchurian Candidate, uh, interesting story there. Um, I don't know how many of you have seen that film, but um, Denzel Washington plays a character who has, you know, clearly been, feels like he's been brainwashed. Something's happened to him. Um, so I decided that he was going to have a meticulous, absolutely, you could bounce a coin on his bed, mil military-looking spare apartment. 
And I said to Jonathan, pretty much the day before we were going to film, you know, I haven't shown this to Denzel. Maybe I should. Do you want me to? And he said, sure, why not? So Denzel and I went over to the, the apartment, and uh, he walked inside the apartment, and he said, oh, dear. And I said, what do you mean, oh, dear? <laughs> we were going to shoot the next morning. Um, he said, you know, this guy can barely keep it together. You know, he, on the outside, he's absolutely meticulous, but in his home, which nobody sees, he is a crazy hoarder. He is unhinged. He has books and newspapers and things stacked everywhere. He is a mess. And I, f I felt like a deer in the headlights. Um, and so I said, okay. I said, I understand that this is a good idea. Let me talk to Jonathan about it because we had already agreed that it was anything but that. So um, I called Jonathan and I said, Jonathan, we have a problem <laughs> or I have a problem. But collectively we have a problem because they were supposed to come there the next day and shoot. So um, I said, you're going to have to push the start or start somewhere else because I have to do X, Y, and Z. I said, what do you think? He said, I think it's a great idea. Well, so um, I called my set decorator and props and everybody else and I said, don't go home. We have to raid every prop house in town. It was late in the day. It was like 7 o'clock at night. I said, we need to absolutely change everything about this location. And it was, in a, it was a very cramped apartment building in Yonkers on the second floor. And suddenly we are stacking it up high with newspapers and books and boxes and noodle po boxes of noodles. And, you know, just we turned it into this chaotic mess. Um, they, the company moved in around noon and it had all been changed. But so, you know, when you ask a direct, you know, asking an actor what they think. Uh, <laughs> danger, danger. Well, you really need to kind of get into it sooner than I did. Um, and and I've, learned, I've learned my lesson from that. Interesting. But, but I suspect you jump into it and you take the challenge where some people would sh shut down and say, mm, right. Well, you don't really have a choice. I mean, at a certain point, I mean, it's good to get feedback. Uh, there were a couple of other places where that happened. William Hurt, when he looked at his office and as good as it gets, he said, um, I don't, I wouldn't have this stuff, you know, and he started being a little annoying about it. And in this case, Jim Brooks said, you know, cut the crap. You're, you're, you're new at this. You've never been in this kind of world before. Let her do what she wants. So occasionally I would get lucky. Um, but, you know, actors normally have really good ideas and good instincts about things. So, you know, it's good to kind of bring them in, but only so much. <laughs> and the timing is very important. <laughs> I, I do want to share a story with you that um, James Mangold said that in one of, I think maybe his first serious film out of school, he was working with Robert De Niro. And De Niro said, I want rubber bands in the drawer, and I want this, and I want that, and this, and this, and this peanut butter jelly sandwich. And then they shot, and of course, he never touched any of that. And Mangold asked him, you know, why did you have me go through this? Because you didn't use it. He said, I used it. I didn't use it on camera, but I used it, you know. So I, I think that's... Well, and, and De Niro, because I've worked with him several times, he's very much into detail. And it has to be organic to his character. So, I mean, I did a film with him called The Comedian, which I didn't think really made too much of a wave out there in the, in the wide world. But he, he, let a, he let me have access to all of his photographs when he was a kid. Um, so that we could have a, a book of his, his work that he could open and, and it was a sort of key prop. But he's very open about that stuff. He, he really wants that kind of uh, input. Um, and certainly in Goodfellas, it was, he was very much in, into that whole thing. So it was, uh, and so is Marty. So the two of them together, they just keep hatching these ideas. Um, so, yeah. 
to you. You have this wide, diverse breadth of work. Is there a moment when you say, I don't know that I can, I can top this, or I, or I can, you know, this was so significant, I almost want to just stop for a minute, or is there always just something else that fuels you? Maybe the question is, what fuels you? What fuels me? A good story. It has to be a really good story. Something like Beloved, which, you know, is a remarkable book. Unbelie I, I was intimidated by Beloved because Mrs. Miss Morrison was so specific about what she wrote in the book. She, I mean, the book itself is like a, a you know, an encyclopedia of, of um, visual uh, input. And so when I did that, I was, I was very aware of wanting to have, um, to, to, to be as good as the book was. And so I talked to her a lot about what I was going to do before I did it. And Jonathan let me do that. He said, you know, by all means, talk to her. Um, but it has to be, it's about the story. And if the story is captivating, then um, I can't wait to sink my teeth into it. What about if the story frightens you, upsets you, when you're first reading it? <laughs> <laughs> That's a leading question. That was. That was. <laughs> um, after I did this film, Married to the Mob, the next film that Jonathan was going to do was Silence of the Lambs. And he sent me the script, and I read it, and I was terrified. I really, really, really didn't want to do it. And I was so worried about it that I, I actually told him. I said, I don't think I can do this. And he said, why? And I said, well, it's horrific. And what if somebody actually does this? You know, what if someone sees this film and does this kind of thing? And you know, serial killers. Oh my God! And, um, and he said, No, no, no. This is a feminist piece. And I said, It's a feminist piece. They're skinning women. You know, what, what is that? And he said, No, no, no. It's Jodie's character and who she is and the fact that she's, you know, she's a, a, a single woman in this man's world and. You know, and that she, she comes out ahead in the end. And I said, okay. <laughs> um, and then, of course, I got into it. And that was when things, crazy things started to happen. Like, um, one day we got a phone call from the hotel I was staying in, and the housekeeper who had gone into my room went out of it screaming because uh, this makeup special effects guy had sent me a heart and the heart was in a plastic bag <laughs> on my dresser. And they, she, this poor woman just took one look at that and just, you know, bolted. Um, and I was, I didn't even think about it. And I also didn't really worry about it because I knew it wasn't real, but she didn't because it looked real. Um, but then I was getting on the phone with these special effects people saying, you know, the skin that you're sending me isn't strong enough to hang on a hanger. <laughs> so, you know, as much as I love the detail here with the pores and the hairs and all of that, it's not hanging on the, you know, you've got to make it stronger or it's going to fall, you know, it was falling off. And then, so I got very deeply into it, um, completely without even being aware that I was in it. Did, how do you shake that? I mean, I go on vacations a lot, <laughs> <laughs> or or at least I try to. Um, yeah, because you do you you get embroiled in something like that, and you you kind of it does take a while. But in in a, in a thing like Silence of the Lambs, at the end of Silence of the Lambs, we all went down to Bimini, where the the scene takes place mm -hmm. where um, Anthony Hops, Hopkins' character is you know just about to do something terrible to, uh, what's his name, Chilton or whatever. Um, so that was, that was fun because we had already done all the nasty stuff in freezing Pittsburgh. And so it was very nice to get down to the Bahamas and have a good time. You know, I just want to go back to texture because I yeah. think about that film in particular, you know, the, the uh, corroded um, quality of the well mm. and of course, the accoutrement, the detail of that world. Then that stark cage that Lecter was in. 
I mean, that's how fascinating for you to kind of pivot from one kind of environment to another. And that just must be so thrilling to investigate well, all these. That's a good point that actually sometimes a location will present itself to me and I'll say to no one in particular, this is a great place. We have to put this in the movie somewhere. So when I saw the Soldiers and Sailors Monument, which is where the Lecter cell is, um, it was this beautiful, um, you know, I can't remember exactly what the period is, but it's early, early 19, probably 1800s. Um, beautiful, beautiful museum in Pittsburgh, Soldiers and Sailors Monument. And I didn't know what we were going to do with it, but I knew that something had to be in it. And so then when the time came for us to talk about how they were going to store Lecter once he was taken out of his cell, the one in underground, um, some, and this just happens, you know, suddenly you'll get a sort of spark of something. And in this case, it was Francis Bacon paintings. And so there's this series that he did of the Pope, what was it, of the Pope series, and then he's sitting, the Pope is sitting, and he's got this terrible mouth, and he's sort of in a cage, almost. So I decided to sort of take off on that, and that became the place that we put Lecter in um, after he was being transported. Trouble is, I went too far uh, with that location because I decided that um, I thought it would really be great if we could see some ribs, and, you know, so, because I was taking the Francis Bacon idea to maybe too literally. So I, we, we, we got a, a sheep's carcass and we took the sheep's carcass and we put it in, inside the cell with, with the head of this poor man who had been eviscerated. And, you know, he still had his, his uh, suit on down below. Anyway, and it had like swinging lights and smoke and everything. And so Jonathan and Kenny and Ed Saxon came in, uh, producers, uh, and Jonathan walked into this space and they took one look at this thing and they turned around and they left. <laughs> and I thought, oh, go, oh, go, no, 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 come back, please, what's wrong? And I got outside and I'll, I'll never forget it. And they, they were, they were, they were, their faces were white, like pale. And I said, oh, what? And they said, people are going to run out of the theater vomiting <laughs> if they see this. So um, you have to tone it down. I said, no, this is, a, this is an art piece. No, it's too much. So out went the sheep. But then they hung him, they hung this guy on the outside of the, of the frame, of the cage. And then they had this kind of crazy flap of skin and so you still saw all kinds of terrible insides, but it was just a little bit less in your face. Is that the right word? No, because it was more. I had, it, I had him kind of receding inside the cage, and he put him on the outside of the cage, but I gave up. You know, whatever he wants is fine by me. Um, and they had smoke and all the rest of it. But, you know, sometimes you just push something too far, and then, you know, you're kind of, told politely or not that it's gone too far, and then you move on. Yeah. Or they move it forward. Or they move <laughs> it forward, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And I, I suspect everyone in this room is a, a, a lover of film and cinema and movies, but um, if anyone ever doubts the indelible impression or the contribution of film, good and bad, I, I mean, that film and the design in particular, and of course performances as well, but when things happen in the news about people missing whatever, I was telling Christy that I immediately subconsciously flash on the images of that house and that well. It has become what I, it's become synonymous with kidnappings, disappearances, whatever. So, I mean, you have imprinted, and I mean that as a compliment, <laughs> even though it's uncomfortable. You have imprinted an idea of what the incarnation of evil or ill of, of madness could be, so it's so powerful. Yeah. Well, I think it also feeds itself. You know, in the case of Silence of the Lambs, it's, everybody was so on point. Um, you know, we got into a whole thing about the cage, the first cage that Lecter was in, and there was originally bars on the cage, and 
of, you know, in the jail, the subterranean jail. But Jonathan was very upset with having these bars in the face of an every single scene, and you can't see the guy's face because, you know, there are bars in the way, and we were trying all these different widths, and, and we were trying plastic, and then suddenly I, I said, you know, in some of the bodegas and some of the and taxis at the time, there were these plexiglass um, partitions. I said, why don't we just make the front of the cage um, plexiglass? And so we tried that out, and Jonathan loved it. And Tak Fujimoto, who's our, who's our DP, he kind of liked it too because he could play with reflections. Mm -hmm. Either you could see him or maybe you could see her face, you could see through. But there was one person who didn't like it, um, and that was the sound man. Oh. Because he said, how is he going to hear her? How are they going to talk? Um, so then I remembered from like banks and, and liquor stores and wherever else they use plexiglass that they would put holes in. So I said, well, let's just put some holes up on top. So. Literally, we, st we, dr we drilled holes. The set had already been dressed and everything. We still drilled these holes in. And then, of course, you know, it's classic Anthony Hopkins, yeah, you know, yeah. cheap perfume. Um, and so it, it all just kind of evolved. It's kind of like an image of a mouse and cheese, and, you know, <laughs> that's really right. trap. And although he's more of a rat. He's, yeah. a, he's a bigger rat. Yeah. Well, then you get to do things that are just fun. Is and, and, and but I, I I think you bring the same rigor to something that's colorful and and electric and entertaining. You bring that same rigor. I think it's again it's part of whatever the culture of that particular film is. And what I like to do is make a container that gets everybody on the same page and lets them you know work the way they can as best they can. With Jonathan and the movie you're going to see now, um, he's a very color. He was a very colorful man, and he loved. One of the things he loved more than anything was Haitian paintings, which are these really beautiful, very brightly colored paintings um, that Haitians do. Um, and I, I enjoy working with color if I can, or no color. It can be one or the other. I mean, when I did the intern with Nancy Myers, you know, she wears black and white and maybe occasionally, you know, cream um, <laughs> or gray. Um, but so that was a very different palette. Um, and, and that was also a different kind of world that was sort of up, upscale Brooklyn. I mean, she made Brooklyn look like Brooklyn has never looked ever. Um, and she, at one point she said, I hate rust. And I thought, oh my God. You know, that's what Brooklyn is. Brooklyn is rust and, and, and crumbling, you know, brick and, you know, great things like that. So I had to re-digest that comment. But um, color is great. I mean, I love to work with color. And um, Philadelphia, I had a scene um, where in the family, uh, um, Tom Hanks and his, boy and his boyfriend's house, um, I wanted to do a bright, bright blue wall, like a really intense kind of ease climb kind of blue. And I painted the wall and Jonathan walked in and he said, no, 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 no. That's too alienating. I don't want, I want people to feel completely comfortable with these people and not feel like, oh, I would never know anybody with a blue wall like that. So we, we kind of had to take the design and the color out of that because he wanted it to be so um, palpable that um, he didn't want anybody alienated. Right. Accessible. He wanted it accessible. accessible. And, and, and so that was a, a complete design choice on his part. And similarly in Silence of the Lambs, when I went first to Quantico to see it, it, it was like hol the Holiday Inn or something. It was like Marriott. It was, very plain, very boring, and I said, this isn't fun. And he said, that's precisely the point. Mm -hmm. Because when she says we're not in Kansas anymore, and she goes and starts crawling around in this, in this um, uh, storage unit, which is filled to the gills with stuff, the contrast between how she was trained 
which was so bland and Howard Johnson's and you know nothing nothing unusual. And then she gets dunked into this world of crazy, you know, people. Um, he loved that sharp contrast, and he was absolutely right. What's your background? Have you taken psychology classes? <laughs> I should. You should. You know, you should be a therapist, maybe. But uh, I, 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 what is your background? Where did you begin? I actually thought I was going to be a journalist. I mean, I went to Middlebury for a year, and then I went to Columbia. Uh, university and um, I was I was heading towards journalism and then I got hired by a friend of mine who was a stylist for a commercial photographer in the city of New York and I was running around looking for perfect props and things for advertising and, and then I started doing afternoon children's specials and then uh, Fame was my first big film as and a costume. As a costume designer. So you are responsible for the iconic and <laughs> shredded, shredded, torn sweatshirts, sweatshirts okay. with all the tie-dyed stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. Which of course has had a, a sort of a renaissance. Oh, yeah. Several of them. Several, several, several renaissances. Yes. Um, I know that, unfortunately, I want to go on and on and on. I'm sure some of you have questions. We're not doing a formal Q&A at the end, but perhaps um, Christy will stay for a moment in the lobby if you wanted to speak to her. But I did want, before we start to roll the movie, there, there were two scenes you wanted to, to just kind of bring to our attention. Yeah, the, the one scene that I think I already talked about, which is at the end where um, the, his wife comes and starts to shoot up this uh, place. That was the one, that was, but there was another scene where uh, oftentimes what you need to do is you need to find locations and in, not every location is going to give you everything you need. And there's a scene where um, uh, Michelle Pfeiffer is now living in a, uh, a sort of pre, actually a tenement house where there's a tub in the kitchen um, and she and her son are living there and her, um, her mob boss friend comes and shows up and says, what is this dump? Well, we used four different locations for that scene. There was one was the elevator, one was a hallway leading to an apartment, the other was the interior of the apartment, and then there was an angle shooting from the roof down into the kitchen. So those were four separate locations that were all tied together and became one space. So sometimes you do that too. You can you have to cobble things together. Um. Christy Zia, you are someone who is the definition of intelligent, collaborative, inventive, inspired filmmaking. And I only can get on my knees and beg you to please come back to Winston-Salem, particularly UNCSA, but we'll River Run. But you really are the epitome of what I think is um, exquisite artistry. So thank you for this conversation. Thank you. It is a great honor for River Run to be able to present our highest award, the Master of Cinema Award, to Christy Zia this evening. Christy, I want to share a little bit of information about what the physical award is. And I know some in our audience have heard this, but River Run was actually founded near Asheville in Brevard, North Carolina, and we take our name from the French Broad River that flows through that portion of the state. Now, when the festival was in Brevard and when it first came to Winston-Salem, it had a completely nautical advertising theme to draw upon its name and its roots near the French Broad River. And I, I, you still see a little of that today. I've seen two of the old inner tubes around town that say That's River Run. That's what those are. <laughs> Certainly, they're so old now, I don't think they'd make it down the French Broad River, but they still look pretty good. Uh, but we don't do the nautical theme any longer in our advertising, <laughs> except with these awards. Each award is unique because it is a handcrafted piece of glass that is meant to resemble an inner tube that one would use to float down the French Broad River. It's always on a, a base of reclaimed wood. This comes from a barn that was being demolished in Randolph County, North Carolina. 
And so, Christy, when we pay tribute to your phenomenal career and your legacy, we are also remembering our own legacy. So, Christy Zia, on behalf of everyone at the River Run International Film Festival, thank you for being here, and thank you for accepting our Master of Cinema. This honor is even more important this year because, uh, sadly, the Academy decided that there were eight categories that were unable to be part of the live performance that went on this year. Um, and all of the people who got awards in these categories had to get them earlier, and then they went ahead and filmed the final uh, results on the, on the day off. So production design was one of the categories that got bumped. And it, it's very, very important to me to say that it's such an important thing that we are all on the same page when we make a film. It's not above the line or below the line because films can't be made without the active participation of people like myself and editors and musicians and composers and um, sound people and makeup and hair and costume, those are, those are the people that make a film a film. So to have something like this uh, this year is absolutely astonishing and so opportune.